All right, I think we have a nice intimate group today. Um, I'm Emily Zilber. I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships here at the Wharton Eshrick Museum. Um, I'm going to ask Katie to show some slides. Katie, my colleague, is here um, advancing the slides for us, but also available to answer questions in the chat. Uh, so, if, Katie, if you can pull that up. I am so excited to have you join us today for a spotlight talk on um, Escherich's connections with the Fabric Workshop and Museum. Um, this is a short 20 minute talk uh, that will highlight some specific things that are on view in the exhibition Home is Stage. Katie, if you can go to the next one. So the program today really is in celebration of our current exhibition Home is Stage, which is on view through December 30th. Um, this exhibition asks visitors to consider Eshrick's home and studio, not only as a kind of set on which the artist's ambitions played out, but also as a stage that hosted players. And often those people were other artists whose conversation, collaboration, connection made Eshrick's life that much richer and more profound. Um, this is the third offering in our 50th anniversary year celebration featuring a series of installations and programs exploring the idea of home. You can do the next one. And to that end, just before we get started with the, the talk in earnest today, I'm going to ask folks to come join us for our next Spotlight Talk, December 20th at noon, which focuses on the filming of PBS's Craft in America episode centered around home in which the Eshrick Museum is prominently featured. You can do next. So last year for Home is Stage, we invited four Philadelphia-based contem Philadelphia contemporary artists um, Emily Karis Duncan, Kay Healy, Colin Pazzano, and Stacey Lee Weber to use the Eshrick Museum as a space, a stage for their creative practice and conversations with the artist's work. We can go to the next slide. Um, showing here two images of work that's currently on view at the Eshrick Museum by Colin Pazzano on the left, his accumulated objects, these incredible uh, carved wood pieces, and then Stacey Lee Weber's chainsaw from the Craftsman series, which is on view in the main gallery of the studio space and really calls back to that space's original um, uh, life as a workspace. You can go to the next one. So the contemporary artworks by these four artists that are on view are complemented by a selection of textile objects on loan to the museum from the Fabric Workshop and Museum, um, all of which were produced by artists and architects whose careers overlapped with Eshrick's, where there's some kind of compelling connection to um, the life, the career, the sort of experience as an artist. And I'm showing images of those four artists here. Um, Lenore Tawney at the top left, um, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown below that, Tokushiko Taek, Cho, uh, Toshiko Takeizu at center, and <laughs> Viola Frey at right. Um, you know, bringing works by these artists into Eshrick's studio allows us to explore ideas around his networks and connections on this kind of intimate and inviting stage, and you know, connects us to the story of the Fabric Workshop and Museum as a space that invites creative people who may or may not work with textiles to push beyond the assumed boundaries of their practice. This really resonates with Eshrick's own interdisciplinary approach to art making and collaboration as much as he's known for um, his advances within um, wood and furniture. Um, one of the things that's important to note um, about this pr project is that this is one of the few loans where we've had um, works from an outside collecting institution come into our space. We can go to the next slide. So a little bit of background about the Fabric Workshop and Museum for folks who um, may not know. Uh, the Fabric Workshop and Museum, I'm going to call that FWM throughout the talk today, is a contemporary art museum that also facilitates experimental collaborative artist residencies as a core part of its mission. Um, you know, the artist in residence program, as I said before, provides artists at all stages of their careers with the opportunity to collaborate with 
uh, the fabric workshop as they experiment with new materials and new media to take their work in new and often unexpected directions. It was founded in 1977 by Marion Kippy Bolton Stroud and originally invited artists who didn't primarily work in textiles to experiment with fabric. Um, FWM has also served as an education center uh, for teaching, printing, um, and so you can see an image of folks making on the, the right. I love that it's both a making space and a, and a collecting space, a display space. Um, FWM has a collection that numbers over 5,000 objects, uh, including the results of many of the ambitious projects that they've hosted there. And the permanent collection includes not only completed works of art, but also material research, samples, prototypes, and documentation of artists making and thinking about their work. We can go to the next. So the connections between the Wharton Ashrick Museum and the Fabric Workshop and Museum have been brewing for a little while. Um, and they really came to a head in October of 2021, about a year ago, when the artist Rose B. Simpson came out to the museum with colleagues from the Fabric Workshop as a part of the research for her exhibition that's now on view at the museum, um, Rose B. Simpson Dreamhouse. Uh, I highly encourage you to go take a look at that show. If you have not, it is fantastic. Um, I'm showing on the left two images from this immersive multi-room installation that she produced. Um, and on then on the right, a shot that I snapped during her visit of Rose and her uh, five-year-old daughter lounging on the walkway and engaging with the studio space, the landscape. Um, Simpson works largely in clay. She's based in New Mexico. And in this installation, she has created um, a domestic narrative, a sort of faux interior space. And she came to the Escher Museum to explore the ways in which artists make spaces for themselves to live in. So a really, really wonderful connection there. If you can go to the next slide. So one of the first pieces, we borrowed works from the collection of, from four artists. I'm showing here Lenore Tawney's Cloud Pillow and Ear Pillow. Um, these are on view in Eshrick's bedroom. Uh, Tawney's innovative interpretations of textile practice were really central to shifting perceptions about the artistic possibilities of weaving. She's a foundational figure in the field of fiber art. And she really broke open notions of weaving and tapestry in much the same way Eshrick broke open lines between furniture and sculpture. Um, she experimented with open warp techniques and created sculptural works that moved fiber from the wall into three-dimensional space, as you can see in the image on the right of Tawny with one of her large sculptural pieces. You can go to the next slide. So Tawny and Eshrick met for the first time in 1957 when the American Craft Council held its first national conference for craftspeople at Asilomar on California's Monterey Peninsula. The two then exhibited together at the 1958 Brussels World's Fair, which is the first time that American crafts were a part of the US pavilion. I'm showing here um, Eshrick's invitation letter from the American Craft Council for that World's Fair and the certificate that he received from the US government acknowledging his participation. Uh, the letter notes that there was room for no more than 75 to 100 objects in, uh, in the Brussels exhibition. So not a huge pool for Tawny and Eshrick to have, have shown together. You can go to the next slide. Later in 1961, Tawny visited Eshrick's studio. Um, I'm showing here a note from after her visit, uh, where she notes that, uh, and I'll read that language here from her, you, your house, and all your work affected me very deeply. We also have this receipt here for the four stools and bowl that she purchased from Eshrick after that visit, with a note that the cottonwood bowl would go on display at the Brooklyn Museum before coming to her studio. Um, it was going to be part of the exhibition Masters of Contemporary American Crafts. I'll note that these two pieces were part, these two uh, documents were part of a re recent cache of uh, previously unseen archival documents that were found. Um, uh, there's a lot, we'll link to some of the, the sort of writing about how rich and exciting that, um, that discovery has been. But in terms of thinking about grounding some of the relationships between Eshrick and his contemporaries in his later years, like in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, these are two of, of, I think, some of our most exciting finds. If you can go to the next slide. 
And I'm showing here that exhibition, Masters of Contemporary Crafts, um, which is on view uh, in 1961 at the Brooklyn Museum. There's an installation view, and I don't know if you can see on the, um, on the right uh, that Tawny's bowl is amongst the bowls that are hanging um, uh, there. And you can see works not only from um, sort of Eschrick's bigger uh, career, but also works from the studio that have, have been brought out and were on view. Um, Eschrick is included here in with artists like Franz Wildenhain, Marianne Strangel, Edwin Shire, um, and is noted, you know, it's, he's described in the catalog for this exhibition um, that he lets each piece develop as he works it. Mr. Eschrick allows the pattern in the wood to suggest the form, building his furniture as though it were sculpture. So that connection again between moving between boundaries that really ties him to Tawny and her practice. You can go to the next slide. One of the things that's really exciting is that the objects that Tawny purchased that are mentioned on that receipt um, are a part of the collection of the John Michael Kohler Arts Center, um, where Tawny's entire estate went after she passed. So here is that cottonwood bowl and one of the four stools that she purchased when she visited the studio. We can go to the next. Um, the Kohler Art Center includes an installation of Tawny's studio environment, which opened in 2021 as a part of their program, uh, which collects and shows artists' environments. They have around 30 of them in the collection. And so the Kohler Center worked with the foundation to acquire a 486 piece collection, including artwork, collages, assemblages, furniture, supplies. Uh, Tawny lived in New York City lofts like the one that I'm showing you on the right and surrounded herself with the objects that propelled her fiber art practice forward. So, um, you know, an interesting distinction in that we have Eschrick's studio sort of as it was, um, it hasn't been taken out of context and Tawny's studio has been sort of recreated in terms of its spirit within the context of a museum. Um, but I think you can get a sense that objects and surrounding one, themselves with objects that really mattered to them, um, you know, were a major part of, of their practice. We can go to the next. So Lenore Tawney was an artist in residence at the Fabric Workshop in 1982, which is pretty early in the history of that program. Um, at that time, she had just completed the installation of her second architectural commission, Cloud Six in Cleveland, Ohio, and had been creating her own unique garments for years. And these two aspects of the practice coalesce in um, works like Cloud Garment, which is a conceptual piece that evokes the feeling of wrapping oneself in a cloud. And the cloud pillow that we have in the studio is a part of that larger practice. The ear pillow that she's made, um, you'll, you'll notice has this, uh, music notation on it. So thinking about how we translate sound as well to a textile form. We can go to the next image. So we also have work on view by Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, who practiced architecture, writing critical architectural theory and taught together since the mid 1960s. Um, Venturi is often credited as the father of postmodern architecture. Uh, especially through theoretical writing, which has been critical to the development of postmodern theory in architecture, like complexity and contradiction in architecture. Um, his motto, less is a bore, riffs off the sort of famous modernist dictum of less and more, and in turn seems in keeping with the proliferation of artwork and ephemera in Estrick's home and studio. Showing here napkins made from his textile grandmother that was developed at the fabric workshop. The design inspiration for the textile came from an old tablecloth belonging to the grandmother of an associate of Venturi and Scott Brown's, and they modified the tablecloth's floral print and added an overlay pattern of dashes. If we can go to the next slide. So here's Venturi and Scott Brown. Um, uh, Scott Brown in a dress made of that grandmother pattern. Um, it's interesting to note that that the two tested textiles on um, not only sort of furniture that they made on the left, you have the Queen Anne chair they made where the, the grandmother textile is a part of the surface, but also on the walls of their um, Chestnut Hill home, uh, in addition to the walls of the fabric workshop and museum. You can go to the next. And that's a particularly interesting extra connection. Um, for many years, Venturi and Scott Brown resided in the Chestnut Hill home that previously belonged to Helena Fisher. 
Fisher was the head of the Shittakonin Company, one of Eshrick's most important patrons beginning in the late 1920s, and commissioned some of his best known works. And that home that both Helena Fisher and Venturi resided in was depicted by Eshrick in his well-known print, The Lane, which I'm showing here, along with a photograph um, uh, courtesy of Mark Sperry that was taken of the house in 1968. We can go to the next image. This is not Venturi's only Eshrick connection, however. Venturi worked for the architect Louis Kahn, uh, Eshrick's collaborator in creating his purpose-built workshop between 56, when the workshop was finally realized, and 58. And then I'm showing on the right, um, Venturi at the center of a panel discussion on architecture and the future of Chestnut Hill, with others including, including Kahn, who is second from right. Um, this was organized by the Chestnut Hill Historical Society in 1967 um, and mm -hmm. relates to, oh, I'm sorry. I think if we can ask everyone, everyone to mute, um, we can go to the next slide. And reflects the fact that they both had, um, you know, signif designed significant uh, buildings within the context of the Chestnut Hill neighborhood, architecturally significant buildings, Khan's Margaret Eshrick House, which features Eshrick, Wharton Eshrick works in the interiors, and then Venturi's house for his mother, Vanna, which is considered the first postmodern residential building. We can go to the next slide. Um, I'm showing here work by the artist Toshiko Takeizu, like Tani. Takeizu and Eshrick are conceptually connected through a sort of blurring of the lines between functionality and sculpture. Takeizu is often credited with being the first artist to close the vessel as a way of questioning ideas of function and explored um, notions of materiality and sensory experience. Um, I think it's impossible to, to think about coming to Eshrick's studio as anything other than a sensory experience. And of course, um, Takeizu is well known for vessels with little balls of clay hidden inside that rattle with, when, when they're moved. There's a sonic element to them as well as her moon pots, which often existed in the landscape and not just the gallery. I'm showing an image of those um, closed spherical moon pots in a grove of trees, some in hammocks, uh, some on the ground, and then her moon balls that were made at the Fabric Workshop and Museum in Eshrick's bedroom. We can go to the next. And an image here, um, you know, at the Fabric Workshop, Takezu worked to translate ceramic forms into printed textiles. We can go to the next. There are lots of connections in their networks. Takeizu was a student at Cranbrook Academy of Art, where she studied under Maya Grotel and Marianne Strangel. Um, Eshrick had connections and relationships with other artists who attended Cranbrook and studied under these same teachers, especially Jacqueline R. Larson, who was close with Takeizu. Takeizu was also really close friends with Henry Varnum Poor. She brought students to visit with him in the mid 1950s and would develop a close friendship with him later on. We can go to the next image. Uh, Takeizu and Eshrick overlapped at a Silomar in 1957. Takeizu was on the ceramics panel and Eshrick was an advisor to the wood panel. And I love these images from the programs showing the faces of the panel. Um, Takeizu and Marguerite Wildenhain were the only women included on the panel. And I think you can get a sense of Toshiko Takeizu's personality from the photo that she chose amongst all of these very sort of serious and, and important men. We can go to the next image. As early as 1955, Eshrick and Takeizu showed together at the Bertha Schaefer Gallery of Contemporary Art. Um, this is a gallery that launched the careers of many American and European um, painters, sculptors, designers, um, I'm showing here on the left a listing from American Craft Magazine, then Craft Horizons, noting that Eshrick and Takeizu were in a show together at Schaefer's Gallery, um, as well as correspondence between Eshrick and Schaefer that's a part of our archival collections from 1946. Um, on the right is an image of Bertha Schaefer all the way to the right of the screen with the painter Will Barnett um, at an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum in 1955. We can go to the next. And here showing the catalog and newsletter from another show that the two participated in together um, called The American Craftsman at the Museum of Contemporary Crafts in 1964. Tawny was also part of that exhibition. Takeizu also sent work to Brussels. So really these were networks and systems that, that a lot of these artists um, existed in at the same time. Um, 
showing here uh, the cover of the catalog as well as an installation view with some of Eshrick's tools. We can go to the next image. Um, Takayuzu established her studio in Quakertown, New Jersey in 1975 after teaching at various universities. She had a work and teaching philosophy that was really grounded in ideas of blending art and life, realized in part through immersive live-in apprenticeships. Um, her home and studio is still used as a creative workspace and a, and a studio functioning studio space. It's close, it's not too far away from Eshrick's own site. Um, and I'll also note here that, that Lenore Tani and Takeyezu were close friends and Tani lived and shared studio space with Takeyezu for several years in Quaker town. So um, another example of an artist who has created this sort of magnificent live work space that really parallels what Eshrick has built. If we can go to the next. And I think we're going to close on that notion of what a studio can mean and how it can represent an artist's world. That's the major connection that I see between Eshrick and the artist Viola Frey, seen here as a student at California College of Arts in Oakland around 1954 and in the garden of her studio in the 1980s. We can go to the next. Um, you might notice a similar narrative between Frey and Eshrick's uh, Paths. In 1955, Frey went to graduate school to study painting at Tulane University in New Orleans. Um, while there, she studied with some of the greats of that time, George Rickey um, and Ma uh, Mark Rothko, who was a visiting artist. But in 1957, rather than completing her MFA, just shy <laughs> of, of, of finishing that work, she moved to Port Chester, New York, to work at the Experimental Clay Art Center with its founder, Catherine Choi, who she had also studied with at Tulane. So um, not only this idea that she wanted to leave her schooling in order to uh, work through her own voice, but also this gradual shift from painting to painting imagery on ceramics to sculpture and three-dimensional form, there are these lovely parallels between Frey's path and Eshrick's own. If we can go to the next. Um, over the course of her five decade, decade career, she created boldly colored figurative sculptures, paintings, works on paper that reflected on contemporary culture, power, gender dynamics. Um, the immense creative output she made used this distinctive personal iconography to depict human figures amidst objects of antiquity, flea market collectibles, interior landscapes. She called herself a brick allure a kind of junk accumulator and reinterpreted um, collectible figurines, philosophical ideas, personal experience and color theory freely to make exciting works largely in ceramic and bronze. You get a sense of that flattening of art and the stuff of everyday life in this image taken a fray in her home and studio in Oakland during the 1980s. We can go to the next image. And so, you know, Frey created the wallpaper that you see here for her 1992 exhibition at the Fabric Workshop, and she showed it alongside these large figural sculptures, like in the composition you see here. This is a reinstallation um, for the uh, show at um, uh, the Fabric Workshop called Hardcover in 2021. Um, you're looking at a wallpaper that's printed on paper-backed cotton has bodies alongside kind of cross-cultural objects, including Buddhas, Western figurines, pre-Columbian pots. And with these objects, Frey hoped to illustrate this kind of sense of interconnectedness, which is this recurring theme across all of her work. We can go to the last. Frey developed her designs remotely from her studio in San Francisco. Um, she had uh, a, Printer, master printer and project coordinator from the fabric workshop who was then based in the Bay Area who would work with Frey in her studio and travel back and forth to Philadelphia to prepare screens and make, make proofs for, for Frey to edit and approved. Um, so the idea that she couldn't leave her studio while she was creating these textiles that would come to bear the title Artist's Mind, Studio and World um, is really something telling and interesting and talks to that importance of an artist in the space they create for themselves. Frey died in 2004 and I'm showing an image of her studio from that time on the left. Um, and I think one of the things that I love so much about this print and how it connects to um, not only the other sort of 
print pillows in the space by artists like June Groff, which represent connections during Eschrick's lifetime, is for the way that the title here is this kind of ideal summation for what a visit to Eschrick's studio feels like. We're taking a trip inside the artist's mind into his studio and into his world. So thank you so much for going on this whirlwind journey through these four objects and artists with me today. As you can see, um, really incredible connections, some direct and some more thematic. And we hope that you'll have a chance to visit the museum while these works are on display through the end of December. Thank you. I think if we have, we might have time for, for one question before we wrap up today. And if nobody has any, it's been a pleasure sharing these with you and we look forward to seeing you on site. Thank you so much.